All right, guys, today we finally get to take an in-depth look at AMD Ryzen with the 1800X processor, the top SKU in the Ryzen stack, which is priced at $499. It features eight cores and 16 threads, along with a 95 watt TDP and comes out of the box with a base clock of 3.6 gigahertz with an advertised boost clock of four gigahertz. Since this is one of the X series of processors from AMD Ryzen, it supports X XFR or extended frequency range, which is advertised as giving more performance as long as the end user is able to cool the CPU well enough. To clear this up for people that may have been led to believe this is an automated overclocking feature that makes it unnecessary to manually overclock for the best speeds, then I'm sorry to say you may be disappointed with XFR as it is limited to only working on a single core and only truly gets utilized when performing demanding single threaded tasks. In addition to this, the XFR boost is limited on the X-Series CPUs to only 100 megahertz, while on the non-X-Series CPUs like the 1700, you'll be limited to 50 megahertz of additional boost on that single core. What this adds up to for gamers is a feature that likely won't serve you any good unless you're planning to play a very unoptimized title that only runs on a single core. As you'll see here, our 1800X sits steadily at 3.7 gigahertz, 1.26 volts, which is the highest boost that I've seen the processor use when performing multi-threaded workloads. So again, I'll say that the advertised four gigahertz boost as well as the XFR headroom are limited to a single core that I found to really only show its strength in a few select single threaded benchmarks like CPU Z. For manual overclocking, things were a little touchy at first as I struggled to find a stable voltage for any frequency over 4 GHz. I thought I had finally settled at 4 GHz at 1.35 volts for my stable OC until I began testing some CPU intensive applications like Sony Vegas and Battlefield 1. That would basically result in an immediate blue screen as soon as I would launch those programs. So I had to settle at 3.9 gigahertz at 1.345 volts, which gave us a decent little bump in performance, but I'd be lying if I didn't say I was a bit disappointed with the overclocking potential of the 1800X. So I'm excited to see what other results other reviewers out there are getting in their testing, as well as anyone out there watching this. So if you happen to get an 1800X, please let us know down in the comments below what your final overclock that you were able to hit and keep stable on your system. The review kit for the 1800X were shipped along with a Noctua Tower heatsink that had a single fan. To try and leverage some additional cooling, I put a second 120mm fan for a push-pull configuration on this cooler. As of the time of me filming this, I am waiting for an AM4 bracket to use in, better, in the Better Red build, and once that gets here, I will immediately jump into testing on water and update you guys with a Ryzen cooling performance video as well as if that offers us any additional overclocking headroom over what we saw here using air cooling. And in my testing at stock settings, the average temp under load was 69 degrees Celsius, and that was after running IDA 64 for one hour. And when I applied my overclock of 3.9 gigahertz, that temperature rose to 74 degrees Celsius once again after running IDA 64 for just over an hour. Now jumping into our performance benchmarking, I went through a selection of synthetic benchmarks to give us some baseline performance numbers between the Ryzen 1800X and the Intel i7-6800K, which is one of their enthusiast level X99 processors. In addition to that, we will also go over gaming benchmarks from a good mix of modern titles. Our AMD testing system uses the Gigabyte X370 Gaming 5, 16 gigabytes of Corsair Vengeance RAM at 3000 megahertz, which was stable from the XMP profile in the BIOS of the Gigabyte motherboard. And all of our games and benchmarks were running off of Samsung SSDs. And lastly, for cooling, I used that included Noctua air cooler that came with the reviewer kit. Switching over to the Intel system with the i7-6600K, which was tested at stock settings as well as with a 4.3 GHz overclock in the Asus X99A motherboard, along with 16 GB of Corsair Vengeance LPX RAM at 3000 MHz, the very same RAM that we used here in our AMD system. The only difference being is that this is a quad-channel setup as opposed to the dual-channel one of our 1800X builds. Lastly, for the cooler, I ended up using the Be Quiet Dark Rock 3, so that should help keep things fair with both systems using air coolers. 
Kicking things off with Sony Vegas and rendering out a 5 minute 4K video with two layers of video, both filmed at 4K, 24 FPS, as well as an additional layer with a watermark over the top of the videos. In a real world test like this, rendering out 4K video, something I do on a daily basis, we get to see the true benefit of having an 8 core CPU with AMD Ryzen. Our 1800X was able to render out the 5 minute 4K video at a bitrate of 50 million in just over 19 minutes at stock settings while reducing that down to 17.6 minutes when our manual overclock of 3.9 gigahertz was used. Things are a bit different with the X Intel X99 part taking 27.6 minutes at stock stock settings and 22.4 minutes with the 4.3 gigahertz overclock. Without a doubt, this is something that will prove invaluable to content creators like myself because if you add up the amount of time that you gain back by shaving off five to eight minutes on every video, that ends up to working a, to quite a bit over the course of a year. Taking that very same file that I rendered out in 4K and converting it in Handbrake to a 4K MKV file from its original MP4 encoding, the 1800X managed to take a commanding lead yet again, finishing its render in 137 seconds at stock speeds and reducing that down to 129 seconds when overclocked. Meanwhile, our 6800K 60, here took 180 seconds to finish that same encoding at stock settings and 145 seconds when overclocked. Cinebench R15, this was a rather interesting one because as you'll see in the performance numbers, our 1800X actually loses some speed with the manual overclock of 3.9 gigahertz. The reason for this is that with the manual overclock, XFR did not kick in like it did at stock settings. However, this really isn't something to be concerned about, I feel, since the only time I've seen XFR uh, matter really is running those synthetic benchmarks since the XFR is limited to only one core as previously mentioned. So hopefully that explains why we see a five point difference here on the 1800X dropping from 162 down to 157 CB in single core testing, while over on Intel it manages to gain ground going from 152 to 178, winning out with its 4.3 gigahertz overclock. But it's important to note that when both processors were at stock settings, the 1800X did get a victory here by 10 CB. In multi-threading, we see a much different story as the 1800X stomps a complete mud hole into the 6800K, pulling in 1639 CB at stock settings and 1698 when overclocked. So not a huge gain there, but more than enough to win here with the i7, only getting 10, 000, uh, 1087 at stock speeds and 1331 when overclocked. In CPU-Z, we ended up seeing the same thing here when the 1800X dominates in multi-threading as well as single-threaded performance, but once again with the manual overclock, we see the 1800X losing in a small amount of performance without XFR to help. Our last synthetic benchmark here probably applies most to gamers is the 3D Mark physics score test. Here we get to see the 1800X at stock settings getting 19,003 and 20,034 when overclocked. Falling far behind at stock settings, the 6800K only managed to pull in a score of 14,920, while when overclocked, actually beats out the 1800X stock score by a narrow margin, getting 19,094. For our gaming performance, we will start with average FPS and then move into separate graphs to go over the minimums. All of our game performance was measured at 1080p ultra settings with a GTX 1080 that is overclocked with 200 megahertz on the core and 300 megahertz on the memory. The reason I'm only testing at 1080p is that as you increase resolution, the performance difference we begin to see comes down solely to the pixel throughput of the GPU rather than the speed or number of cores on your CPU. So by testing at 1080p, we get to see which of these processors is capable of delivering the most FPS as possible. Beginning with stock performance testing, these numbers are extremely close, some of them so close that it's pretty much within the margin of error, but we can see the 6800K does win consistently over the course of 10 games tested, with just a few exceptions being The Division and GTA 5. However, when looking at our other titles here, we see Intel winning by an average of roughly 4 FPS. One other exception here would be Overwatch, where both saw a pretty hard bottleneck in testing because when monitoring performance, it was apparent that this game only utilizes up to two cores 
at any one time. This held back our GTX 1080 at 1080p to only about 80% utilization and resulting in both CPUs tying at 154 FPS. The landscape here changed up a bit with the minimums where Ryzen took the lead in four titles with Sniper Elite 4, Battlefield 1, The Witcher 3, and The Division, while also tying in Overwatch and GTA 5 with the 6800K. Now looking at our overclocked game testing, we see that Intel is able to take a win thanks to its higher overclocking potential being at 4.3 gigahertz. Here we saw a tie in only one game, Overwatch, but like we discussed, this comes down to a bottleneck of the games using only two, the game using only two cores on either of these processors. Once again, we take a look at the minimums, but now with the CPUs overclocked, we get to see the advantage swaying to Intel. While the while the 1800X did tie here in a few titles like Rainbow Six Siege, Overwatch, and Sniper Elite 4, Intel ended up sweeping the other seven games tested. So. In conclusion, I think what the 1800X is able to do at this price point of $499 is extremely impressive when you consider that Intel parts that are in its same weight class like the 6900K, which is over $1,000. Unfortunately, I don't have a 6900K to test, but comparing scores on my synthetic benchmarks with other reviews out there on the $1,000 CPU, I can tell you that the 1800X manages to maintain a very strong lead in multi-threaded tasks like video editing. The margin of victory certainly narrows, you know, against a comparable 8-core 16-thread part, but it's still winning or tying the 6900K while doing it at half the price and with a much with much cheaper motherboard options out there. While when it comes down to raw game performance, we do see the 1800X trailing behind here against the $410 price 6800K. It shows its true strength at multi-threaded tasks, and in my opinion, the performance difference we see here would not be enough to sway me to get the Intel CPU if I had any intention of doing some sort of work that would benefit from more cores. So if you're a streamer, YouTube, YouTuber, photo editor, graphic artist, or a content creator of any kind, there is no reason right now to buy an X99 processor. You are much better off going with AMD for better performance at a better price. For those of you out there that are strictly gamers, the decision is really going to be up to you for which side you'd like to support. Also, another thing to consider though, is that Ryzen could prove to be better over time as more DirectX 12 titles become available, and hopefully developers begin to leverage the additional cores and threads to get the most performance possible. So, with that, I'm going to go ahead and get on out of here, guys. If you enjoyed today's review, please consider leaving us a like or subscribing if you're not already. And if you want to buy a Ryzen 1800X, that I'll be sure to leave a link down to that into the description below over to Amazon. But I'll catch you guys next time. Sure.